Well, hello folks. Today on the channel, hope everybody's had a good day. We are going to do a segment on artifact authentication. And I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can. And I'm not going to try to use a bunch of jargon that the archaeologists use. Only when necessary. But uh, I know you guys know a lot of this stuff. But already ahead of time. But what I want to do is shout out to this video is dedicated to me and my shadow and lost in time. You guys are killing it. And I really enjoy watching your videos. And you guys are finding some good stuff. There's some days, yeah, you don't find anything. And we were going to do a video for you guys. We went down to South Canada and we looked for four hours and never found anything. So I get it. That's the way it goes. And then, uh, of course, in Oklahoma, you can count on one hand how many days you can hunt the river and the wind's not blowing. Yeah, it affects your audio and everything. So anyhow, so... uh I'm going to start off here with me and my shadow. We have your uh, Holland point pulled up here. And I got a little pointer here. And you'll be seeing that in this video quite a bit. So I got the, this actually is a special bulletin number four. It's a four book set volume. And this is actually Greg Prino's work here. The other ones are Robert Bell. But right here's your point. I'll almost guarantee you. These two examples right here, and this is the one I think fits yours the best. Uh, no doubt it's got the little ear on it. I know one side, I believe, my memory serves correct, is broken or just splintered up one side, but that's okay. You, you still got 90% of it there to identify it with. And it's a whole new term now. They've typed, they call typing typology, if that's what you want to you wanna go with, you know, and that's fine. So since I come back in here, and I want to point a couple things out here. These two top examples, this A and B, uh, are from the Gilcrease Institute collection. And they re it says, Prino says, represents variants outside of this cache group, meaning these three. These three came out of, uh, I believe, Illinois. I believe is yeah, St. Charles County, Missouri. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, they're these points here you can see this one's had some retouch on it now greg did the artwork on these three right here from photographs so that in itself is pretty impressive uh this could be probably disputed to be a scott's bluff but greg even says and we'll get into some of this right here uh he has remarks he said the holland point and i always liked this from greg he always made it a point to to come down from uh, the type site, description, distribution, and then the age cultural affiliation, by the way, is 9,500 to 85. Now notice BP range. And he says that these were found on large, these chipping techniques are similar to those found on large Dalton points. This plus its general configuration places the type in early archaic along with Dalton. Plainview, Hardin, and Scotts Bluff with a BP date 95 to 85. Range. Notice there's some key words. Range. So that's what we need to kind of focus on on aging. And then this is off the type side, of course. And this, uh, by name, this point was named after Warren Holland in 1966. So that's how far back. Uh, a lot of these excavations went back to, and all the way back in the 30s too as well, 20s and 30s. So that's that's what you're looking at. And this, this me and my shadow, this is your point right here. Dead ringer. When you found it that day, uh, I was amazed when you pulled it out. And I thought, that's a Dalton. Because just looking at the base. And then I realized when you turned it, and I looked down that edge and it had no beveling on it. That was a dead giveaway to me instantly that that's, that's in the Holland family of points there, if you want to call it that, or that cultural affiliation, we'll call it. So, uh, these are indispensable, in my opinion. Uh, you, you can try to get these. My son went online and tried to find another volume of these. We got some noise. This greenhouse. 
the reason we, we did this video in the greenhouse today is because we got a lot better lighting in here to, to do this printed material. But anyhow, this is a four volume set and also uh, this came with the uh, Southern Plains Lithics, the small points. And this is also Oklahoma Anthropological Society. But here's what's neat about this one. This one, come on in here, says it. My wife's done. She's my videographer. Now this is in our area. This is Pittsburgh County. And this shows you the, the uh, outcrops of these different churches. And uh, it goes from the Vaculite Woodford Jack Fork, Big Fork Church, Pine Top, Johns Valley Shale, Wapanucka, and Stanley Shale. And I'm not going to try to confuse you guys anymore with too much of this. But here's what here's what's important when it when it comes to typing points. The easiest thing is what we just did. The hardest thing is to try to identify that material. And Prino had drawers full of raw material, lithics, that he used for identification on, on material. But even sometimes I've, I've had him paper some of mine that said unknown, material unknown. So it's not uncommon to have that happen. So, I mean, if, if you don't know what the material is, that's not a big, great big problem, really, when you get right down to it. So I'm, I'm going off my notes here, guys. So. So the C C14 dating, there's been a lot of disputing on uh, archaeologists for several years. You guys are going to hear some traffic. We're on the main road, and then we can do about it. We'll just have to work through it. And uh, the C14 has, here in the last few years, has been kind of put on the back burner for OSL. And OSL means optically stimulated luminescence. So if you've got a piece they put that underneath that scanner and they scan that laser across that point. And so whatever patination is in the top surface of that point also has mineralization with the patina. So that's what it measures. It's, it's measuring that real thin age layer that's associated with where that point was found. And I've had some debate with people that says, well, if you guys find these in the riverbed, all that's been worn away. Well, I, I don't know. Most of the dating we're getting back on OSL has been pretty accurate according to, you know, our reference material, what it says. So I'm not sure that that's a, that debate's over. But anyhow, we'll, we'll see. And, and I, Dr. Barnhart, uh, he's an uh, archaeologist out of the University of Texas. He's probably better known for... Uh, Aztec, Olmec, Inca, and all those civilizations, but he even stated recently that he believes that OSL is the way forward. Uh, so that's a start, and that's, that's encouraging if they do that. So the next thing uh, that I want to touch on is Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock. If you're not familiar with these guys' work, please watch this. You owe it to yourself of understanding why the Younger Dryas happened, what caused it, and what happened to the Paleo people, uh, specifically Clovis and, uh, and uh, uh, Folsom, those two cultures. So this will give you a better understanding. So here's what I would suggest. Go on Joe Rogan, the Joe Rogan's channel, and the first one is video number 606, and that's Randall Carson, 606. The one with Graham Hancock, where he's talking about his work on America First, his book is very, very, I've watched this thing a half dozen times and I still can't get enough of it. It is video number 872 on Joe Rogan, 872. Okay, now moving on here, uh, I want to show you guys, I've got an article, and I've also got a, a uh, Central States calendar. This is from 0102, and you can see these different collections these guys uh, submitted for the, the calendar. But what I want to point out is right here, uh, this is a point I found on the Arkansas River near the Bixby Bridge back in 94. This point was six and a quarter inches long. 
Can you imagine how long this one was? I think this one was right out a foot long. Twelve and a quarter, I believe. But uh, that ended up in this this guy's collection is Oliver Scrivani. If I can get this calendar to cooperate. That's Oliver right there. He's out of Two Rivers, Wisconsin. But uh, ironically, this point ended up in one of our local collectors collections, and that would be Lyle Nickel. And I'll show you more about some of his stuff here in this other book here in just a minute. But uh, that's why I've always uh, kept this. This point, when I found it, it was very foggy that morning. It was laying down there, and there was sand across the middle section, and all it was exposed was the base and the tip. And when I pulled it out, to, I couldn't believe it. I, I just, I still, to this day, it's hard for me to believe finding that point in that manner but anyhow you know what i mean guys you find them on the river so you, you understand so the next thing i want to point out here is some of greg, greg perino's articles that he wrote this for central states by the way it's a quarterly that he did and it was titled points and barbs and this is about kennewick man and let me just read you just a little of this. We're trying to hold this video around 20 minutes, but we'll try to get everything in. Uh, there was some college uh, kids watching a, uh, a, a hydroplane race on the Columbia River. And this is dated his article July 28th of 96. Uh, this happened obviously before this date. And one of them, they waited out in the river to walk, get a better look at the boats. One of them stabbed his toe on something. And it was a, a human skull partially buried in the bottom. Well, being kids, they wigged out, so they took it up and hid it in the bushes on the shoreline. And uh, so they called the police because obviously they thought, well, maybe someone's got, we got a cold case going on here. So the police called in the coroner. The coroner gave it to the forensic anthropologist. And he identified this skull as having a large number of Caucasian features. Wow. So, then the story gets better. So they thought it was a white trapper, you know, we're talking 1800s. So, so after they recovered the rest of the bones with the skull, they, uh, they ran a CAT scan on this thing. And it revealed there was a point lodged in the pelvic area of this skeleton. And it was a part of a spear point of the cascade variety. So then they said, well, we need a carbon date. We need to do a carbon date. And this was really surprising, Prino says, 9,300 to 9,600-year-old Caucasian male is one of the most important archaeological finds of the decade. And... Uh, so I'm not going to elaborate a lot more. I'll just give you the high points on this. So the Northwest Coast Indians, uh, they were mad when they found out what the archaeologists said, that this is Caucasian. And so Prino elaborates on that. He points out some groups from Japan and different areas that may have been responsible for this skeleton being Caucasian. So what happened? With pressure on the core, what did they do? There was two more skeletons, by the way, in that river, alongside this one. They go down, and they cover up the site in limestone boulders. The skeleton in question here is still under lock and key. So what little we do know was from that early examination. But what I'm pointing out here, this was right would have been right after the Younger Dryas wound down, around 11.6 to 11.8 age range. So we have uh, evidence there were peoples in here before Clovis. So that's my next point. When you challenged that theory, your career was over. Now that's all changing. But it's important to note this because uh, we're finding there's more and more evidence that we're seeing now that that points out that uh, there were peoples in America way before Clovis Folsom in that age range. So uh, 
If you guys want copies of that, I'll give you my information here at the end of the video, and I, we will give you copies of that. Just, you know, the mailing fee is all we need back, and that's it. So, uh, Greg also worked on the UFOLA project. He was a self-taught archaeologist. He did not have a degree in archaeology. A lot of people find that surprising, but uh, he was the foremost authority on North American artifacts. So, I give a lot of my uh, my uh, experience. I'm, I'm not I'm not credentialed. I do not have any credentials on any of this, but I do have a lot of experience. I've handled thousands of artifacts. When John and I first met, John Richardson, by the way, he's uh, he's across the lake from us here. Uh, I had cases full of points and artifacts and bone and all kinds of that stuff. So uh, got to know him real well over the years. Uh, you would love John if you ever met him. By the way, we're gonna try to start doing a, a, a collector series. And we'll be videoing people's collections. And some of these guys are some of the biggest and best collections in, in the central United States. And most of them are here in Oklahoma, which that's really neat. And so Lyle Nichols, the other one, uh, like I pointed out earlier on this big point, he has a real, real good Alabates collection, High Plains Paleo. So let's, I've covered two things here at once, basically, but what I want to elaborate on on, on this uh, talking point number seven here, there's a man by the name of Jack St. Mars. He's an archaeologist. He went to the Bluefish Caves in Canada. He was probably the most well known for his career being ripped to shreds by the academics because he challenged the Clovis first. He said, these dates go back to 30,000. He was literally ripped limb from limb by these people. Let this noise get out of the way here. So who didn't, who didn't get ripped? over their their theory and their hypothesis well that was dennis stanford had it not been for his work at the smithsonian he would have been run out of town and his career would have been ended no doubt but his take on it is the salutrians from france came in here and, and brought this technology this early technology in so i got one more point i'm gonna do here in a minute but first we're gonna we're gonna do i, I missed uh lost in time but i got you right here here's your point this is the oklahoma now we got an ant on our book artifacts this is a special collector's edition these are all pretty much oklahoma uh, and this is a really really good book if you have a chance this is volume one i don't know how many volumes they made of it but uh you can do your own research on that and try to find out there's some more on the back. I think this is Lonnie Hartline's work, and I will be visiting him and doing a video, by the way. But here we go. Lost in time, I think I have found your point here. Man. Okay, let me find it. I thought I had it marked. It's in the... Uh, it's in Lonnie Hartline's collection. Here's Jim Cox. Really nice hell gap, by the way, right there. Really nice agate basin right there. All right. Well, where you at, Lonnie Hartline? Well, stay with me, guys. Here, I'm trying to get us there. It must be toward the front end up here. Larry Merriam, he's out of Oklahoma City area. There's some Calf Creek stuff. And he's got one heck of a collection. Probably one of the biggest collectors in Oklahoma that I know of. There's another real good Calf Creek. There's a two bevel hair hay. That's what they look like before they get diamond and cross section in the shape. There's a big set of Caddo blades. Again, these are all Oklahoma guys. Here's Lyle Nichols, start, the start of his collection. Wow. That's all I can say is wow. 
If you never had a chance to visit with any of these guys, if you, if you go to an artifact show, it's well worth your time. There's some corner tang right there. There's a med tang, which is pretty rare for Oklahoma. And Lyle has a really good frame right here. Most of that's all alabates. I don't know who Karen Neal is. I've never met her. Don't know who she is. Here's Lonnie Hartline, the start of his collection. This is all uh, Spyro Mounds period stuff right here. Big old dance blade surrounded by all these arrow points. There's look at those drills. You'd have to collect for years to get that that many drills. Stay with me here, lost in time. We're going to get you there. Here's my friend John Richardson, and I'll show you a point that he traded me out of because he collects uh, a lot of Dalton material. That's the biggest calf creek right there, guys, I've ever seen. And John Richardson has it. Unbelievable. This is a Scots Bluff he had that came from the Jinx area from a sand plant operator. And Perino said it's the best Scots Bluff he's ever seen. Wow, that's saying something right there. Right here is the point that he traded me out of right here. That was found in Muskogee County on the river. It's made out of Woodford Church, believe it or not. Me and my wife were hunting that day and there was a circular four-wheeler track. They'd cut a donut in the sand and part of this thing was sticking out of the side of that track. We were walking back to the truck. All right. Right here. This is what I wanted to point out to Lost in Time. I think this is what you had. This is out of the four county mounds, the Spyro stuff. I think you have an eccentric. I know yours has little notches cutting these barbs. And, and people would call it a tribute point or an honor point. That's another name for them. But I really do think you have that. I mean, yours wings out flared more, but I, I really think that's what you have really do and uh we've got we got to do some more research on that to find out but I, i'll bet you that's that's what you have so now i'm going to show you guys a little trick here this is the last point that john richardson ever found on the river and i'm pretty sure it's a hell gap but here's what you want to do if you got low light or if you got grainy material and you can't see your your flaking Use one of these little lights right here. These little quartz lights. Now see there? That lights the whole face of that point out. You can see that flaking. So this is diagonal. It's really pretty material. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I think it's Permian Age Chert. But look at that ding. I almost guarantee you that's what broke it right here on the base. But I'm I'm pretty certain that's that's hell gap. Here's a calf creek that we found local here by us. No ears. No surprise, huh? See there? Really good wicked serrations on that point. And here's a little Midland. See the little see the little striking platform I left in the center? All a Midland in is, guys, is technically an unfluted Folsom. And this is pretty grainy material, but look right here. Look where they beveled that. They broke it. And they went in there and, and made a hafted scraper out of that. So no surprise there. These people were really resourceful. So now we got a frame of points here that are blades and knives. I got the hasp on the wrong side. This is the one I always wanted to drill a hole in. <laughs> it's already got this big depression in it. And it goes all the way through. I've, I made it one day drill a hole in that and make me a knife necklace out of that but that's pretty neat and so here's what i wanted to do is do a little differentiation between knives scrapers and and blades first stage blades these two right here these two right here i have got to show you guys this look at the similarities this was found in the canadian river and this was found in the arkansas river but man Look how, look how they were using that rough edge on that 
that rascal. And I went in here. See there? See how that light works to show you the beveling? They worked that really hard. And look how similar these two styles are. Perino, I didn't get papers on these. Look where it's stained. But Perino said both of these are archaic age knives. So that's that's pretty pretty old for for that style of knife. This point right here, I still believe it's a first stage Clovis. The reason why it's 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 tapered in right here on the bottom. And that came out of the Canadian River. But see some of the overshot on this rascal? That's that's what I'm talking about. These right here, I'm just going to lay them out. Every one of these right here are end scrapers. Even this big one. See how it notches right there? See those notches right there on each side? It was hafted to here. And that's your working, your working bit of that. Every one of those... And that, this is a preform, guarantee you. All of them are. You could have made a point out of them, but they were using them for end scrapers. So let me uh, get the best for last here. This is one I've been telling you about, me and my shadow. This is one I recently found back in November, I believe it was. That's the big Clovis preform. Look at the overshot on that dude. They're standing at the bottom. That big old overshotting across that face. I don't know if you can see it. There's a there's big overshots. If this camera focuses in on this, and look, there's the other thing you can do with this light. We got too much light, but you can see some translucency there on that edge, right there, right there. That's a high grade. I thought at first it was per it's Permian chert, but I'm not sure what what it is. I've been told by a Tom Westfall at Lithics, uh, Mammoth Lab, Mammoth Casting Labs. I'm getting mixed up here. They do a lot of casting, and he said, "Yeah, he said that is a uh, late stage close, no doubt." So I hope you guys have found this interesting and uh, informative, and we'll do some more later. Uh, but I'm gonna give you my contact, my phone numbers: nine one eight six eight nine zero three seven five. My email is all lowercase, LelandShanks62 at gmail. So if you guys want to get a hold of me direct, I have no problem with that. And I'll help you any way I can. And if I can, I can turn you on somebody that can. Uh, so enough of this. <laughs> I hope, I, like I say, I enjoyed doing this. And I enjoy you guys' videos. And Lost in Time, your son Caleb, I subscribed to his channel. He's killing it. He's got a really good collection for his age. Uh, unbelievable. You guys are doing a great job. So click the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and we'll do some more of this.